CBDCs are picking up steam around the world. The latest survey from the Bank for International Settlements shows that 93% of countries are developing central bank digital currencies, and they expect we could see 24 CBDCs in circulation by 2030. Joining me now is Oliver Lynch, CEO of cryptocurrency exchange Bitrex Global and a financial regulatory lawyer with over a decade of experience in Europe, the UK and the United States. Oliver, welcome to Kitco News. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. So you have an interesting uh, position with regard to CBDCs. On the one hand, you're operating a crypto exchange and many people in the industry see CBDCs as maybe a threat to decentralized crypto. Um, but you also do a lot of work on anti-money laundering and other regulatory issues. So I guess you can see things from the state regulator's perspective as well. So uh, I wanted to start by asking you how you view CBDCs first from the crypto perspective. Uh, do you see CBDCs as an attempt to shrink or eliminate the private decentralized uh, ecosystem? Well, it's really difficult to say uh, to analyze CBDCs as if they were a homogenous entity, because the fact is there are as many policy in instances, there are as many uh, competing ideas as there are CBDCs. And whilst it might be useful um, in terms of the general presentation to group them all together, actually, they're as disparate as you like. And, and you know, there's very little that binds them together other than the acronym and the idea that there's some kind of government control over them. So when you say, like, how does a CBDC, a CBDC do X, Y, or Z? It's very difficult to answer that question because as we saw in the, in the BIS report, we've seen in the UK um, response in the past couple of days, it can kind of mean whatever on earth you want it to mean um, and, and have whatever features you might or might not want it to have. So for those people that are worried about um, increased control and increased centralization. Yeah, those beers are there and they're legitimate on certain iterations of CBDCs. But people are worried about AML and KYC requirements and how they work. I understand your frustrations because no one can tell you how it's really going to work. And that's because each iteration is just difficult. And I think this is the problem with an awful lot of it is people throw around the term CBDC and talk about it as if it's kind of an understood single idea. And it's, it's really not. All right. Now, and from specifically thinking as Bitrex Global, what, wh how do you view CBDCs and the potential for CBDCs uh, in the coming years? Is this something that you expect would be eating away at the market share of uh, cryptocurrencies? Or is this or is this something that would be complementary, would be parallel? We, we've heard that we've heard similar we've heard similar divisions within uh, central banks. Some central banks are saying we see CBDCs as uh, as fulfilling a different role, not necessarily competing. But then we also have uh, results like the BIS survey showing that uh, central banks seem to be increasingly monitoring uh, the use of private cryptocurrencies. And uh, and concerned about, for example, stable coins. So, what um, from from the perspective of a crypto exchange, are CBDCs of any sort? Uh, are you expecting them to crowd the market or to or to reclaim some of the space that the cryptocurrency ecosystem is now occupying? Well, when I speak to our biggest customers, and whether that's corporates or on the retail side, the question I get most often is, what's the point of a CBDC? What is it trying to achieve? What, why would I want one of these things? Um, and my favorite analogy is, is someone said, um, it's a bit like someone coming up to you and excitedly saying, hey, I've discovered this new kind of firework, right? And what you do is you plant it in the ground and, and you shoot it up in the air, uh, and and then that's it. Nothing happens, and everyone else is standing around being like, "But we we were in it for the for the bang and the bright lights, right?" I don't understand why would I want this thing. And I think that's the view of a lot of crypto people is what they're interested in at heart. The core of um, the concept of cryptocurrencies, digital assets in general, is a distributed ledger. Is this DLT technology? Is the blockchain? And so when you get people coming, and, and by people I mean central governments and central banks saying, oh, we're going to do a CBDC without the distributed ledger technology. I just get a bunch of people standing around saying, like, just because you put the word digital in it doesn't mean that it's 
important or exciting or I want any kind of part of it. So I think before you can say, if it's going to crowd out um, altcoins, is it going to crowd out Bitcoin? Is it going to crowd out um, stable coins? You just kind of have to ask yourself, what, well, what is it? Like, what is this product? What is it for? And at the moment, there's just this sense that um, governments are jumping on a bandwagon. You put the word digital in front of everything, right? I'm sitting here on a digital chair in front of a digital table. It kind of it's a bit like the Batmobile, right? You put the word bat in front of anything, it sounds a bit cooler. Um, and it's it's just kind of it's not true. Just putting the word digital isn't enough. There has to be a purpose for it. And at the moment, it does just seem like CBDCs in general are a solution in search of a problem. Well, this this was uh, to my to my next point, which is putting on uh, your your regulatory law hat. Uh, what what is the perspective of central banks on CBDC? Again, we can't entirely generalize, and we'll get into some examples of uh, different central banks and clearly different motives. Obviously, different models for CBDCs as well. But what what problem are CBDCs solving today? We have uh, instant. Uh, digital payment systems uh, that are very efficient, relatively inexpensive, uh, certainly not a deal breaker in terms of moving money around. Um, we, we have cryptocurrencies, uh, which are fulfilling some role it, to the degree that people want something very digital or very independent uh, that, that already exists. So what exactly, is putting yourself in the perspective of a regulator, obviously we have um, well, I'll let you answer the question, but what, yeah. what, are, what are the major motives, what are the major valid motives, assuming that everyone is trying to make things more efficient, trying to make things more, more um, stable, what are the major motives for, say, the EU, the UK, the United States to be exploring CBDCs? Well, there are some. There are legitimate reasons for it. Um, and I think you don't need to become the sort of um, conspiracy theorist on what the real motivations are. But I think actually when we get into it, the the the, the lack of depth, those reasons, does give rise to a slight pause as to what's really going on. So yeah, cross-border payments in, in, in fiat currency mm -hmm. are a real pain. Like they're expensive, they're slow, they're sluggish. You could just solve that or make the bank solve that directly. Um, but I guess maybe that's more difficult than creating a CBDC. So for cross-border transactions, there, there probably is a use case. Um, but then you kind of run out of reasons, right? And so you say, well, okay, maybe there's something to these conspiracy theories. Maybe it's what I said just now, which is governments kind of want to be in the cool gang and take the word digital a lot. And you think maybe it's a centralization issue and they want control of information. And you think, well you very quickly look at the, the governments that were first in this space, China being an obvious example, and you say, well, information is a hugely valuable commodity um, to, to uh, in, in that region. Is that a motivating factor? Is that a concern? And then you get all the way down to, you know, um, this is an attempt at TradFi uh, to fight back against crypto in some senses. And I can sort of see that, but actually the way TradFi is doing dealing with crypto is, engaging with crypto and doing it properly. And we've seen a number of institutions, everyone from sort of Goldman Sachs down, um, trying to get involved in crypto in a in a sort of non-CBDC, but cryptocurrency way. So that doesn't quite ring true. And then you get people who point out the advantages from a state perspective are things like the ability to turn money off, right? Uh, if, you, if your economy is based on a CBDC and your money can be switched off at the tap by the government, that gives people a lot of pause for thought and takes you back to the sort of early principles of uh, of crypto and of DLT, where you say the point here is to maximize individual freedom and to maximize the ability of the individual, especially in jurisdictions around the world where there might not be the confidence in state authorities and their processes. Um, you, you really do quickly begin to think, well, I don't like conspiracy theories, but I can see something sensible here and I can see something concerning here. And I think that's what's motivating a lot of the backlash against CBDCs. If the case could be made stronger, something in favor of them, um, then, then you could do away with some of those arguments. You say, oh, you know, you're just kind of crazy. Uh, we're doing it because of X, this phenomenally good reason. Um, in the absence of a phenomenally good reason, you just begin to think, well, what's the point? And, and to answer your question about AML KYC, 
I don't see that CBDCs are any better on that front. If you try and trade on Bitrix Global, you will be KYC to the same standards as any kind of bank or financial institution. Uh, we're regulated in Liechtenstein, we're regulated in Bermuda. We apply the same global standards. We know exactly who our customers are. We know what they're trading and how they're trading and where that money is going. That's true if they're trading in Bitcoin, if they're trading in any number of altcoins. I don't think that's any more true just because you're trading in special government uh, tokens. Um, so again, I'm just it's there. There are problems with fiat currency, and maybe that's the irony. There are problems that they could solve directly. I'm not sure that CBDCs are the answer to that. And until someone really explains what is it for, what are you trying to achieve, I don't think that people are going to. We just don't get it. Right. Well, let's uh, let's drill down a little bit into this uh, the BIS survey results because there are some interesting findings here. So we've seen the number of central banks, as you say, uh, no overriding reason, no no huge problem to solve. That's been clearly articulated. Uh, no massive upside for markets or for the government necessarily. That's very clear. At least uh, no um, no obviously uh, non nefarious reason. But, uh, but here we are. So uh, it was around 65% of governments were working on CBDCs at some level in 2017. We're up to 93% today. Um, I'm wondering, is looking at it from the perspective of threat versus opportunity, many, many central banks have explained that they see an enormous opportunity in terms of blockchain technology. So that, that blockchain technology is something which is going to be revolutionizing finance in general, not just, not just currencies, but finance in general. And this is a proactive attempt on their part to be part of this next generation of, of finance. So you have the positive. Do you see it as more of a, again, we can limit ourselves to, say, the Europe, the United States, and, um, and the UK, but we can also go broader. Do you see this as more driven by the opportunity of blockchain or more driven by the threat of unregulated or more opaque, more anonymous uh, cryptocurrencies? Well, I think it's driven by the opportunity. I think my, my instinct is that what's really driving all of this is the desire to be um, in the at least in the middle of the pack, if not leading the pack on the part of governments around the world. No government wants to be, you know, the guy that got left behind. And so I think there's a lot of interest in, in understanding what DLT and what crypto can do. Um, there is a certain amount of fear of a loss of control, and I think that's a legitimate fear. Um, but I think the, the, the main motivator, and let's look at the UK as a good case example, right? Because it's no coincidence that the ramping up of interest in CBDCs in the UK is coinciding with the establishment of a regulatory framework for digital currencies. We saw a consultation paper launched in March of this year. Response is expected um, probably uh, at the end of the summer. In, the, in Europe, the same, right? CBDCs ramping up in interest just as Mika has been adopted uh, and in the run-up to that being adopted, uh, being implemented at the end of next year. I think what you're seeing is government saying, there's something interesting going on here and we want to be a part of it. And the way we can be a part of it is to control it a little bit. So it's kind of the same narrative as institutions, right? If you're one of the major banks or a, a major financial institution, a broker or, uh, a, or a fund, you want to be part of crypto. And we, we hear that every single day. Institutions want to get involved and they're getting involved on the digital asset crypto side of it. That same motivating factors or those factors do seem to be what's going on at central bank level, but they come to a different conclusion, right? Because their conclusion is um, we want we want in, we want to be part of this digital asset um, step change. How do we do that in a way that's recognizable and advantageous to us in terms of centralization of control? So I think they probably diagnosed the um, the, the, the situation, they probably understood the situation. They probably understood um, the, the drive and the direction of travel of, as you say, finance as a whole. Um, but at the moment, there's this gap there where all of those good things and all that interest and all of that um, wanting to be part of something exciting goes into the machine. 
and somehow spewing out of the machine are these um, impenetrable uh, at best and nefarious at worst things that they get labeled as CBDCs. So again, you know, right, right diagnosis, wrong, wrong, um, wrong solution. All right. Now, uh, one of the other interesting basic uh, divisions among CBDCs and one of the interesting uh, perspectives from this survey are that 74% uh, of the central banks surveyed are experimenting with both wholesale and retail CBDCs. Uh, this is interesting because what we've seen, what you would expect to see is countries that have a very robust and very significant uh, private banking sector would be very worried about the about a retail CBDC that essentially eliminates where where you become a customer, you know, you know your customer, your KYC is uh, the central bank knows every customer. The central bank is essentially in the position of knowing every transaction, following every dollar. Uh, that would be in, in countries where an enormous amount of the money supply is created by private banks, that would be very worrisome just for the foundation of their economy. But we see the overwhelming majority of these countries, the overwhelming majority of these central banks, including in the developed world, pursuing both tracks. What approach, and for example, in China, again, interesting example in China, very authoritarian government, but an authoritarian government that seems very uh, cautious about destabilizing their own private banking system and has taken, has, has favored the wholesale side for that reason. Uh, what, which approach do you favor and what do you think the calculation is there? Well, I think the calculation is at the moment, I think you said what, 74% of governments were, were doing doing both. I I think it's the absence of a policy decision, right? Because if you can't figure out why it is you're offering CBDCs, you can't really figure out how they're supposed to work, what problem they're supposed to solve, or, or why it is you, you're spending all this money, time and effort on, on producing them. There's no point picking a track, right? If you can't explain why you're doing it at all, it makes no sense to say, oh, we, we, we're doing this thing for... You know, insert reason here, but we're only doing it for wholesale, or we're only doing it for retail. So I think it's just a matter of at the moment, like let's just push all the all the buttons and see where we get to, and maybe one of them will turn out to be uh, a good enough route. Yeah, I think a, a lot of the concerns you raise about destabilizing uh, private banking uh, sector is a concern, uh, and I think there's a, there's going to be a lot of very awkward conversations between central banks and private banks in those jurisdictions and in the UK and in, in Europe uh, and in the US for that matter. Um, but I think governments at the moment and central banks at the moment are avoiding having to have those discussions by coming out and saying, oh, you know, nothing's off the table. Right? We, we heard that from the UK this week. Nothing's off the table. We can do whatever you want. Um, again, that to me, that sounds great, right? Nothing's off the table. We can configure these things however we want. That actually just sounds like you don't have a plan, right? We're, we're pushing ahead, full speed ahead. We don't know where we're going, but we're going there at breakneck speed. And you're like, okay, maybe slow down a bit. Um, going fast and and not even breaking things because you're not going to crash into anything because you don't know where you're going. Going fast isn't in itself uh, a, a, a desideratum, right? It's It's just... Figure out what it is you're trying to achieve, figure out the best way to achieve it, and then go do that. Uh, and I think if they can do that, that there is a legitimate route for CBDCs. In my mind, it's actually, I think, probably going to end up having to have a retail component in the same way as when you look at cryptocurrencies. There are a bunch of people that say, oh, we're just aiming these at, at high net worth individuals and sophisticated investors and corporates. Actually, that doesn't really work. Um, and, and that is... One of the major problems that traditional finance has is that it's excluded from the benefits of cryptocurrencies. So many people that are underserviced by traditional finance and the interesting products where governments say and regulators say, sorry, uh, you're, you're not welcome in these products because you're too stupid or too poor or both. Right. Because you're not a high net worth individual. You're not a sophisticated investor. So you can't have access to this product. And if that means that you can't get a mortgage or grow a business, then sucks to be you. Uh, I think a lot of people feel very failed by traditional finance in that regard, have moved to cryptocurrencies 
um, in many cases to to fill that gap. And that's a phenomenal uh, advantage that, that, that crypto can bring to people. If CBDCs don't even help in that regard, I think, you know, where are they going to get their, their users from? Where are they going to get people interested in this, excited about this? Unless they're going to start forcing people into using CBDCs, I think if you don't try and do it without a retail component, it's just going to be hollow. And this is this is an interesting point as well because the the birth of Bitcoin, Bitcoin comes out of the two thousand eight financial crisis, and which is a, a massive mismanaging of other people's money by businesses, which then becomes a massive overreach by government to make the businesses whole and people still lose and uh, you devalue the currency. So this is, the, the argument for CBDCs is a little bit odd when you take into account that a, need, that a great deal of the motivation of people in cryptocurrencies is to have assets outside of fiat, outside of the government's own assets, outside of the government currencies, because they watch the government currencies get manipulated and devalued. It's not called manipulation when the government does it, but uh, the central bank is allowed to print money. The central bank is allowed to control the money supply, and uh, the central bank will will furiously devalue their own currency to make their own debts manageable to, to solve to solve short-term problems by creating a long-term devaluation of the currency. So it's hard to see who's the market for CBDCs if you're not going to be necessarily attracting a crypto market when crypto's whole reason for being in crypto is to avoid central bank currencies in the first place, digital or otherwise. Yeah, and so that's why I think you come back to where I was at the very beginning, which is CBDCs aren't for crypto people, right? They, they, they're not... When I speak to my clients about this, then they're just not interested um, in in something that is has ripped the core out of what crypto is about. So, is there a use case for them? As I say, yeah, there is probably on the international uh, cross border transfers of money, which is still a terribly inefficient, expensive, and just awful way of of, of doing business. Is there a use case for them in general? Yes. Uh, is that a crypto? Are are, are there crypto products? Do they tick any or hardly any of the boxes uh, that crypto ticks? Any of the advantages that it brings? No. So where, wherever you fall on the on the spectrum of conspiracy theory, is it governments and central banks just wanting to be cool and say digital all the time? Is it that plus they want to give a little bit more control back to the central bank and indeed to, to private banks um, to have a little bit more uh, familiarity is it that they want a load of data uh, on every single transaction and they can see uh, the incredibly poor life choices that I made when I go shopping on a on the weekend uh, or is it that they want to be able to do really nefarious things like turn off money and stop you going to shops and direct your spending I don't it doesn't really matter where you fall on that scale you've got if, if you're pushing for CBDCs you've got to explain what your what your positive motivating factors are. And at the moment, that's just not there. Right. Well, one of the ways we can maybe infer some of those motivating factors is by looking at some recent news, uh, which countries are doing what and why that might be. So uh, in Russia, we've seen uh, a ramping up of their of their digital ruble project. Uh, the bill has now passed the, the lower house, the state Duma, and it's on track to be, it's probably more or less a formality to go through the upper house and then be signed by Putin. So what do you think the motivation is in a country like Russia? Obviously, there are the sanctions. There's the the Russia-Ukraine war, and there are sanctions. But this is really about controlling, well, maybe controlling isn't the right word, maybe it is, but this is really about the currency that would be used within Russia. Uh, by Russians, that this would be a retail, uh, a, a retail CBDC for Russians. So, what what do you think is the motivation of a country like Russia to be ramping up, and speeding up, and going full steam ahead with uh, rolling out of a retail CBDC, while simultaneously having a lot of new legislation that is trying trying very hard to control the use of cryptocurrencies in the country. So, even crypto miners in Russia need to sell their crypto to uh, 
out, it needs to leave the state. It can't end up in circulation. They're doing everything they can to, to, to reap the profits that could be there for the country of the crypto ecosystem while making sure that crypto does not circulate. It's illegal to advertise that you accept crypto payments and to accept those payments as well. It's also uh, illegal to be creating this supply of crypto through mining and then having it circulate within the country. So what, what is the Russia example telling us about, say, a retail CBDC? Well, I think we have to be careful because there's a sort of a, 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 a maxim, an adage that says uh, bad, grid, bad cases lead to bad conclusions. And so it's very easy to point to those things going on in Russia and try and extrapolate reasons and, and uh, analyze CBDCs in general. And I, it actually, when you get to pretty extreme cases like Russia, which are under international sanctions, are um, non-democratic or have... have you know, any number of problems, trying to figure out what CBDCs and crypto mean and do and can work together by looking at Russia um, might not be the most illuminating way of doing it. So, um, yeah, that's not to say there aren't lessons to be learned. Just do it with caution. It's always difficult to get general rules from the extremes. Um, but what you're seeing and there is certainly giving fuel to people saying, look, CBDCs are bad because they're a way of avoiding sanctions. Actually, no, um, there's nothing inherent about CBDCs that means they allow you to avoid sanctions any more than there's anything inherent about, I guess, anything other than cash, right? The cash is a really good way of avoiding sanctions, unfortunately. And as many people have said, if cash were invented today, they'd ban it. Um, but there's nothing actually about CBDCs. If you really want to avoid, uh, if you really want a um, a mechanism for ensuring that you cannot avoid sanctions. Well, crypto is perhaps ironically your best bet because with crypto, when you've got things like the travel rule being implemented around the world, we can track exactly where every single transaction is going, where it's come from, who it's going to. If you really want to create a system where sanctions cannot be evaded, well, you should be promoting cryptocurrencies, not CBDCs. Right? The, the public blockchain it. itself, the public, transparent, How much traceable public blockchain. Public you want? Independently verifiable, open to everyone to inspect and to see. The blockchain means you cannot, if done properly, you cannot avoid sanctions. So, again, I, can you use CBDCs in a nefarious way to avoid sanctions? I'm sure you can. You can do anything in a nefarious way. You can use you can use any tool can be used for good or for bad. And this is why I say you've got to be a little bit careful when it comes to trying to gain lessons or learn lessons from extreme examples. But when you say that, okay, the second half of your question was about Russia's approach to um, to crypto, like non CBDC um, cryptocurrencies. Uh, again, motivations for clamping down on crypto, I think, are very disparate, right? I think there is a very strong moral legitimate reason for having strict KYC regulations uh and, and and you know all the all the sort of stringent checks that a proper regulatory framework for cryptocurrencies brings with it. Bidgets Global was one of the very first exchanges to be in favor of Mika. We are ourselves regulated and we've subjected ourselves voluntarily to regulation ever since we were first founded. Um, because we think that the future of crypto is the grown-up, responsible, respectable, regulated uh, participant of the financial sector as a whole. So there's nothing wrong with, with regulation. What there is a problem with is using that regulation in a way that is nefarious. So when you talk about the, the steps that Russia is taking to clamp down, it's not the regulation's fault, it's the way it's applied uh, and the way it's implemented. So it is, it, it, as I say, very difficult with Russia to get a sense of what's really going on. The political overlay is about as impenetrable as it gets, maybe with the exception of China, where it's slightly more impenetrable as to exactly what's going on. Um, but I think even, even though I, I think you've probably got a sense that I'm a little sceptical on CBDCs, I wouldn't want to use Russia as my example to say, see, this is the evil that it can do, um, just because, you know, Russia's the big. This is a specific example in the room, and you know, casting it as the the boogie monster. You see, all oh, Russia's doing it, and just sort of wave your hands and say, "Isn't it scary?" Uh, it, it would be tempting to do it, but actually, 
you know, it, it's not a legitimate use case. It's not a legitimate example. If 93% of central banks are doing it, Russia can't be your key example. Well, you, you mentioned China, so uh, let's look at a very different example. So uh, we had uh, an announcement from China's Xi Jinping basically saying that he sees CBDCs as one of the keys to expanding their Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, this is all about creating a, a coalition, creating another group of countries, presumably built around the Chinese currency, and creating a seamless and integrated and convenient uh, and frictionless uh, currency, basically like a, a monetary union almost, at least for, for foreign, foreign exchange yeah. purposes, uh, which would make it much easier for them to impose or impose to ensure that their currency is the currency being used by all these countries that are getting all this investment for building ports, building rail, building all the ways that China brings raw materials into its into its country and creates these these uh, relationships of debt with uh, countries around the world. So here we have an example of a country that is exploring CBDCs domestically, very much so, and has the most advanced, uh, furthest along in the rollout of CBDCs among any major economy. But on the other hand, CBDCs are seen as uh, a key to creating essentially another, another uh, monetary union, an another bubble, uh, another coalition, which, is, which ought to be enriching China, giving them a great deal of control over their own trade and their own relationships, and also uh, explicitly saying this should allow us to pull away from the US dollar and this should allow us to worry less and less about sanctions. Sanctions uh, against China, sanctions against China's partners, including, say, Russia. So what is, the, what is the CBDC angle there? I understand why they would want the yuan to be uh, the currency that's being traded. Is the CBDC just a, a less, uh, a more frictionless or a more convenient way, making the yuan more convenient? Or does the CBDC give them other tools uh, that, give, that give them more power in those relationships? Well, let's try and strip out the politics from, from the CBDC aspect of this, right? So again, it's easy to say China, scary, OBOR, Belt and Road, as it's now called, uh, this is all about a, a big power play between Chinese currency and US currency. Let's try and strip out that and say, okay, actually what China has identified here is a large geographical area where there can be a single currency that is um, to some extent controlled by the Chinese central bank. Well, actually, you could use that same argument, precisely the same rationale when you're talking about a, a Pan EU CBDC, a Euro CBDC. I've even heard someone talk about um, a Commonwealth CBDC, where you, instead of having the UK Bitcoin, which by the way is the world's greatest pun, I love it and I laugh every time I say it. Um, instead of having Bitcoin, you say, well, everyone in the Commonwealth, um, however many nations are in the Commonwealth these days, I, I forget uh, exactly how many it is, but let's link up the UK. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, a whole bunch of uh, India, uh, a whole bunch of Pakistan, a whole bunch of other economies and have a free flow of money there. And then you begin to say, okay, divorced of the politics and the general scary nature of, of fear mongering about China, um, there's something really interesting there. And then you begin to see, okay, maybe actually there is a positive case to be made. And this is what we talked about earlier. When we talk about international payments, cross-border transactions, is that strong enough reason to create these things? And it seems like President Xi is saying, from China's perspective, yes, right? Maybe not by itself, but in conjunction with all of these other policies that China is implementing, there is an advantage to having that single system. I mean, it's the same arguments that were, were banded around when they introduced the euro 30-ish years ago, right? Have a single market where there's a single currency and there's nothing digital about it, but the, the monetary policy, the macroeconomic arguments are exactly the same. So if you see CBDCs as the next generation of a euro type arrangement, well, 
it depends on what you think about the euro, right? If you're in favor of the euro as, as a concept of having a single monetary uh, area in Europe as a way of tying jurisdictions together, then you should be in favor of CBDCs, CBDCs doing the same thing. If you don't think that's appropriate, and there are an awful lot of, of problems with the euro in terms of analyzing it as money uh, and the, the, the decoupling of the uh, currency with the central banks, and the relationship between the ECB and national central banks and all that kind of stuff that's far too complicated for me to understand. Um, if, if you're skeptical about that, you'll be similarly skeptical about um, multi-jurisdictional CBDCs. Uh, so divorce the politics from it and actually divorce the, the digital bit from it. And what you get down to is a pretty age old discussion about how you can use economic and monetary policy to tie uh, multiple jurisdictions together. Right. And then uh, they're also essentially making the case that uh, the United States and to a degree uh, Britain have enjoyed for a very long time having their currencies be reserve currencies for other countries, having their currencies be the, the currency that of international trade. And China is saying, we're doing a lot of international trade. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if our currency was convenient? was if, if there were advantages to using our currency for international trade and we would lose some of the disadvantages of being forced into other currencies and forced through other channels uh, in terms of efficiency and in terms of cost. So I, I guess that's a, it's a valid perspective. Uh, of course, it's hard to divorce politics from these. Uh, it's a thought experiment to divorce politics from these, these issues. Uh, but it's, uh, yes, uh, if, if, you're, if you're prioritizing trade, Anything that makes trade more seamless, uh, less expensive, more convenient is, that's the European example. And uh, regardless of your position, I guess, on, on the euro, uh, we've definitely seen a lot of economic growth in Europe over the last uh, decades. So yeah, for sure. And, and so maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe we've solved it, right? Maybe we are, the two of us are beginning to thrash out the real use case for CBDCs. Um, and, and look, I, I, I'm I'm kind of joking, but I'm not really joking. If if CBDCs can be used to facilitate cross border international transactions, make international trade easier, remove barriers, uh, and actually get rid of all the problems that do exist with the fiat banking system, then you know let's let's get someone out there making that case, and then we can move away from the conspiracy theories. Um, until then, uh, I think. Try again is the answer that comes from uh, from from both the traditional finance and the crypto communities. Well, there's one uh, because you mentioned that there's one other massive uh, conspiracy theory related to this on the international front, which is the argument's been made that what country would ever accept to have, say, the digital yuan when, by by definition. The, the way the way these CBDCs are being constructed, uh, would you would be able to invalidate enormous amounts if you have a trade partner and you're very unhappy with them, you can kill all the CB, all, all of your CBDC that they hold. You can essentially bankrupt, you can eliminate accounts, you can eliminate, you can invalidate the money remotely. So this this idea of remote control of the CBDC, whether it's wholesale or retail, we're talking about it. We're talking about your CBDC in the hands of your trade partners or in the hands of your enemies or in the hands of other states. If every, if every CBDC is traceable, controllable, if China holds, not necessarily China, if any country has that degree of digital control over the CBDC in circulation, then they're in a position to turn it off, uh, to devalue it, to turn it off, to make it illiquid would be enough. Uh, to hold it hostage. So there's, uh, I, I don't think you and I have uh, have necessarily created the best, not quite yet, the best uh, example for why that would be great for international trade because the other countries would be very aware of, uh, it, holding US dollars is one thing, but the US, dollar, the US government can't kill your US dollars remotely. Uh, if a CBDC includes that functionality, then that is a major threat. And that, I guess, brings brings us to our, Last example, which is uh, the Brazilian, uh, a, a, a very enterprising um, analyst and uh, blockchain expert, kind of unpacked the source code of the Brazilian CBDC and found 
uh, found elements in the programming that would allow the Brazilian government to freeze the funds, to, to kill, or to freeze or to essentially invalidate the money remotely. Now, uh, the Brazilian government has basically said, this is all experimental at this stage. We have all this, we have all these different functionalities. Nothing about this is, uh, is nefarious, but this is, this is one of the arguments, and maybe you can speak to this as our last, uh, our last technical point here, is you have the argument, you have the slippery slope argument or the, the potential, the potentiality arguments of you say you're going to roll out a wholesale CBDC, but you can turn it into a retail CBDC with the click of a, of a switch. So the dis distinction as far as implementation, as far as rollout, the distinction between wholesale and retail is immaterial because it's, it's the flip of a switch and now it's retail, and it's the flip of another switch and now it's turned off. You also have the argument that uh, as soon as you put this, this is again the, the, the difference between the public blockchain versus uh, government uh, currencies, cryptocurrencies, or not so crypto, digital currencies, is if you put this, this in the hands of the government, the government isn't going to take itself to court when it decides that it will now need a kill switch could be any. It could be a terrorist attack. Could be uh, the rise of a certain type of uh, of organized crime. And now, oh, we have a very strong reason to want to be able to remotely kill a bunch of our own currency. Well, they can build that functionality in, and no one can take them to court. The government changes the law. The government changes the programming. This is digital. They can't change the serial numbers on a dollar bill, but they can certainly change the makeup of a CBDC. So, I guess the question is, what is this? Do you need to be a conspiracy theorist to have these deep reservations about the, the inherent potential of CBDCs to be used for control or to be simply invalidated remotely? No, I don't think you need to be a conspiracy theorist, but I think the solution is identify these as issues and challenge government, central banks, people promoting CBDCs to solve those challenges, right? I'm only going to get involved if you can demonstrate that you have solved for X, Y, and Z, right? And if you can't do that, then your project's going to fail. Now, the advantage of all of this, and it's an advantage shared by cryptocurrencies, is that you can have this, uh, and I, I don't know the example you're talking about, but this enterprising uh, guy go in and or, or woman go in and analyze the code and look at what's there and say well you can this these are the powers these can be what's this can this is what can be switched on or off these are the features that can be enabled or disabled and actually this is one of the big advantages and people are interested in in crypto is okay it you might require a high level of expertise and a lot of time but you can go in and you can see exactly what is happening exactly what can happen the features there's no hiding and I think the advantage of CBDCs and of crypto uh, against fiat currencies are um, the transparency layer. So yes, there are a lot of problems that need to be addressed. Um, people are going to expect incredibly robust answers as to why it is not just um, you're going to trust the government not to do nefarious issue X, Y, or Z, but that they cannot do it. It is not technically possible given the features of the code to do that and if they can come up with robust enough answers to those questions then conspiracy over and if they can't then you know you kind of answered the question yourself which is why enough would you want to get involved in that kind of thing all right well uh thank you so much uh for taking the time and joining us today oliver this is uh fascinating stuff and we'll definitely have to do this again no, absolutely. It's been it's been a really interesting conversation. Thank you for having me. I'm Ernest Hoffman for Kitco News. Keep it here for more expert analysis of financial markets. And don't forget to subscribe. Begin your path to financial freedom. Gain up to a $7,000 bonus on us. Register and use promo code. Deposit and enjoy a 7% bonus. Available now. Link in the description.